blessing to be in the house of the Lord once again, and to uh, all of us that are together virtually, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have um, our Bible study time period set aside, but first we want to go to the Lord in prayer um, before we go into the the Bible study lesson. Um, Obviously, um, there's a lot that that uh, we need to be praying about. And there's uh, a few things specifically that we want to uh, lift up in terms of prayer requests. Uh, We would ask that um, you keep the following names uh, in your your own personal prayer time as well. Uh, We want to pray for uh, Clyde Berry Sr. and Clyde Berry Jr. for Milton Arvey, for Luanna Johnson, and also for uh, Brother Edward Wheaton. Uh, We want to keep them uh, lifted up in prayer. And also as we um, have more and more schools uh, coming back on campus, we definitely want to keep our children uh, that are are, uh, going on campus or that are virtual also the teachers, the administrators in the school districts uh, here in the Houston area around the state of Texas and all over the country uh, as they try to navigate something uh, new and something different that's unprecedented uh, in this time period. So if you would join me um, in a word of prayer and then we will head into our lesson for the day. Amen every head bowed and every every eye closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you on today. We thank you, Father, for just the opportunity to see another day, Father God. We know that every day is precious, and the time that you give us is precious, Father God, and we ask that you would make us wise stewards of the time that you give us, Father God. Uh, We've called out some names, Father God, specifically that are uh, in need of your your comfort, Father God, in need of your healing. Um, We ask that you you would be with them in their situation in a special way, Father God, that you would touch and move on their behalf, Father God, and that somehow, some way that in their situation you would bring them and others closer or even into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We ask, Father God, that you would place a hedge of protection around our children, Father God, that are going on campuses, that are going into uh, elementary schools, Father God, high schools, colleges, and universities, Father God, and those that are learning virtually, keep them safe in the home, Father God. There's blessing in their going out and their coming in, and keep them focused on their studies, Father God. We ask that you would be with the teachers and administrators that are designing the instruction and curriculum, Father God. We ask that you would give them uh, patience and understanding uh, with the students and also, Father God, the parents that are sometimes doubling as teachers and that are uh, trying to navigate this new uh, normal as well, Father God. We just ask that you would keep um, all those that that are in the home, Father God, that are out on campus, just bless them in their going out and they're coming in. We ask these and all other blessings through the precious and powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, on, uh, on this Wednesday, um, as we take a look at the current culture, and there's a lot of compromise in our in our society and as a believer we have to navigate how do we deal with a culture and a context that is constantly trying to get us to compromise that is uh, just trying to get us to um, go along so we can get along um, a culture that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. Um, how do we live? How do we live in such a, such a culture? Um, 
Well, the Bible has much to say, much to say about how to uh, develop or how to define, how to develop, and how to display Christian character. And one of the best places that we can see this is in the book of Daniel. So if you would turn with me to the book of Daniel, we're going to be looking at chapter 1 for the time that we have together today. We're going to look at chapter 1 for some guidance um, as to how we can define, develop, and display Christian character. So the book of Daniel is written by um, Daniel. Um, you know, it should seem obvious. However, there are some people that dispute that the book of Daniel is even written by Daniel. So uh, we have much evidence to let us know that Daniel uh, was indeed the author uh, based on the time frame that the book was written, um, who it was written to, and what was going on uh, around him. And Daniel, as the person, uh, arrives uh, in, a, in a situation uh, at a very young age that challenges him and his friends in terms of the type of culture that they live in that is completely contrary to how they were raised. So they find themselves in a whole new country with laws and practices that are contrary to how they were raised, but Daniel and his friends find a way to continue living out their values and living according to what was revealed to them in scripture and how they were trained as young men before they were uh, taken away and departed from their homeland some 350 miles away from everything that they knew and their parents all included. So if you would just uh, take a look at uh, Daniel chapter 1 and just for... Um, clarity and understanding. Let's go ahead and read uh, the portions of it as we go. So first we want to take a look at uh, verses 1 and 2. And I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, your version may be slightly different, but it is the same uh, inspired word from the same Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. So verses 1 and 2, uh, in the book of Daniel, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Okay. So taking a look at verses 1 and 2, we see that uh, we have not been introduced to Daniel just yet, but we are introduced to two kings. We're introduced to the king of Judah named Jehoiakim, and we're introduced to a king of Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar. And so the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim gives us a time stamp um, a, a historical record that we can figure out where we are in time. So your first, if you're looking at your handout, your first uh, blank is the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim was 605 B.C. So 605 years before Christ is where we are in terms of time. And so with that, we had three different waves that Nebuchadnezzar is going to attack Jerusalem, and this is the first of the three. And what happens is uh, we see that not only does he come and attack the city, but he is successful, being Nebuchadnezzar, and he is also taking away some of the articles from the house of God. So that's referring to the temple. So obviously the Jewish people, um, the temple was, was uh, 
the pinnacle of what they thought of as far as their culture and uh, their religious uh, experience. And so this was obviously a, a tremendous embarrassment to not only have the city sacked in terms of a military standpoint, but to add insult to injury, Nebuchadnezzar takes these articles out of the temple and brings them not to a temple made for Yahweh, for the God of Israel, but for his God, which was a pagan God. And so Nebuchadnezzar, uh, his name means Nabu has protected my inheritance. So that was a pagan God. So obviously it's, it's in his name that his uh, pagan religion is, um, is uh, displayed to us even in the very mention of his name. And so you got to take into account that Daniel as a young man is part of this uh, deportation that's happening since Nebuchadnezzar has been successful. And so this should not have been a surprise because we can actually go back to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28. And you can turn there with me, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and look at verses 49 to 50. And that gives us a prophecy that this is going to happen. And this is based on discipline of Judah because of how they were dealing with God. Okay? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 and 50. And the Bible says, The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly nor show favor to the young. Wow, does not respect the elderly and does not show favor to the young. Does that sound familiar? So we see that because of Israel and because of Judah's disobedience to God that now this has come to pass that they will be taken away um, to a, by another nation and so now since they were not obedient to God they will now be made to obey at the point of the sword they will now be made to obey a foreign king so now we're going to get uh, introduced to Daniel and some of his friends in verses 3 through 7. And we're going to read that aloud. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. Now from among those, the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So now we're introduced to Daniel and his friends. And what we learn is that the king himself, so Nebuchadnezzar, instructs uh, one of his officials 
who was um, designated as the master of his eunuchs to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the nobles, okay? And they are looking for the absolute best and brightest. So this was a strategy that um, kings would employ whenever they were taking over an entire people group is that first they would come for the youth and they would come for the best and the brightest. They wanted to come for the people that were wealthy and assimilate them into their culture and then they would convince everybody else in the old culture to adopt the new culture and then the old culture would just pass away and they would just assimilate um, and be, for lack of a better term, naturalized into the new regime, the new government, the new practices. Does that make sense? And so that's what they're looking to do. That's what Babylon is looking to do with Judah when they're getting, again, these, these best and brightest. And what they, they, they give a reason. They want them to serve in the king's palace, and also they, they want to teach them the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. So they want them to forget everything that they already knew. So obviously they're the best and the brightest, but we want to take their, their knowledge, their skill and ability, and we, we don't want them to use it for what they had learned in the past and the culture they knew in the past. We want that to be put to use for our purposes in terms of Babylon. Babylon wants them to use what they have been given in terms of their talent for the progress of Babylon, no longer for the progress of Judah. And so we see that not much has changed. We see that in a current climate and culture is that we have a society that is built around trying to get the most out of the best and the brightest and not necessarily for um, uh, the best reasons always, okay? And so someone may have a particular set of skills or ability and it's how can we put that forward so we can make money off of that or how can we put this person forward so we can sell advertisements or how can we get this to benefit a particular corporation instead of necessarily the good of all of the people in a particular country. So again, this, this government system is, is, is trying to take advantage of what these young men have in them and train them for their own ends, not for how they were raised as uh, young Hebrews. And so when we, when we meet them, we see that they're not living really a life of deprivation, but actually that they're well provided for. So the king has appointed for them that they would eat the king's delicacies, and they would even drink the wine that he drank. So obviously, if he's the king of Babylon, he's going to be eating pretty well and drinking pretty well. And he's saying that to the, the, the person that's in charge of them, that, hey, give them the same type of food that I eat. Give them the same type of drink that I drink. Put them in a master's program for three years to get them ready for when they can serve in the king's court. So oftentimes the, the culture, society will offer especially the youth, great things. They'll offer wealth. They'll offer celebrity. They'll offer success, notoriety, all these different things. If only you just do for this organization or that organization, for this corporation or that company, for this particular school, And so Nebuchadnezzar is, is setting the stage to, again, continue this assimilation. And now we're actually introduced in verse 6 to Daniel and his friends. 
They're named Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And we notice that very quickly that the chief of the eunuchs, so the, the, the person that was in charge of these young boys, changes their name. So their Hebrew names are given in verse 6. And then in verse 7, their Hebrew names are given, but then now they're given Babylonian names. And it's very interesting taking a look at what is done in that process, because in the Bible, your name carried a meaning. And it said something about your character, or it says something about your family, or it said something about your perceived destiny. And so by changing a name, this was a demonstration of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the conquering king. This was a way that he could demonstrate his authority over them. If we look back in Genesis, we see Adam is given the authority to name everything. And so when you give the when you have the opportunity and you have the authority to name something, then you have authority over it, you're in control of it. So this was a a way to start the process of getting them to forget about their past life, of getting them to forget about their culture, getting them to forget about their religion is that we're going to change your name. We're going to change everything about you to conform to what we want you to be. Does that make sense? And so Daniel, Daniel, this is your next blank. Daniel means God is my judge. God is my judge. And then his name is changed to Belteshazzar, which means lady protect the king. Lady, protect the king. And then we see Hananiah. Hananiah. And I apologize for the, for the, the uh, typo there on uh, your handout. But it, it means Yahweh has been gracious. Yahweh has been gracious. But Shadrach means I am fearful of a God. I am fearful of a God. Mishael follows suit. His name means who is what God is. And that's a wonderful question. Who is what God is? But his name is changed to Meshach. I am humbled before my God. Interesting in both Shadrach and Meshach, the, the God is not referring to Yahweh. The Babylonians worship multiple different gods. And when you look at the pagan name that they're given, the Babylonian name that they're given, they're no longer referring to the God of the Bible. They're no longer referring to the creator of heaven and earth. They're no longer referring to Yahweh, but they're referring to some type of pagan God. So do you see how their very name being changed, um, how dramatic of a difference it is in terms of how they are to think of themselves and, and what type of culture they're in? And then Azariah, the fourth young man, his name means Yahweh has helped. But his name is changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, which again was another pagan god. And so what would happen is that now they're going to be referred to, they're not even going to hear their own name unless they're talking amongst each other and they're put in this, this um, under the, the, the watch, under the care of this chief of eunuchs. And so that, uh, 
that lends us to, to understand that these boys were made eunuchs and we can see that actually foretold. Um, if you would take a look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 39. Go to Isaiah chapter 39 and go to verses 5 through 7. Isaiah chapter 39, verses 5 through 7. And this is important just to see how there are no surprises in terms of prophecy. There are no surprises to God. Because um, again, remember, these, these young men, they have been taken away out of their land. They've been put under the, the watch of the chief of eunuchs for Nebuchadnezzar. Look at what Isaiah chapter 39, verses 5 through 7 says. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So we see that here in Daniel um, chapter 1, we see a fulfillment of what we read about in terms of Isaiah, saying that if, if um, we are, as we continue on, these are some things that are going to happen, and that's because of the actions of, of King Hezekiah, uh, who showed um, his house and all the treasure uh, to, the king of, to, the, to a prior king of Babylon. And so one thing we can take from that, looking back at Isaiah chapter 39, verses 5 to 7, and then we look forward and see that fulfilled and culminate in Daniel chapter 1 is that the prior generation okay, has a tremendous and profound effect on those that will come after them. So whether that's parent to child, parent to child, it's grandparent to child, whether that's from uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a church from pastor to pastor in terms of leadership. Same thing with a corporation or government from president to president, from governor to governor, from mayor to mayor. That the actions of those in the prior generation can have profound effects even for generations down the line. So that should make us very cautious about what we do and what we're okay with because it can have far-reaching implications beyond our current time. So there's things that we do in this life that will echo throughout generations. So we have to take a look at sometimes as what are the things that we are doing in our lives right now and how will those things affect the next generation and the generation after that and maybe even the generation after that, whether that's personally, whether that's professionally. Um, but these things obviously are, are all connected. And so Daniel is having to experience what Isaiah prophesied about. Even though we're dealing with two different kings, we're still dealing with the same... Um, we're still dealing with uh, Israel and Judah, and we're dealing with Babylon. Okay. So <clears throat> taking a look at, at, verse, at verse 8 and through verse 16, we now see that what's happened in the situation with Judah, how Daniel has come into the picture with his... Um, with his friends, at least three friends that we that we know of that the Bible tells us about. 
And then we see how Daniel interacts. Because already this culture has caused him a lot of pain. Um, it's ripped him from everything that he knows in terms of his parents, his family. Um, he's in a new land that has its own language, its own literature. Um, he's made to be a eunuch. So obviously a very painful uh, situation. And Daniel and his friends have just had things taken from them and taken from them, and they've been taken physically away. And so now in the midst of all of that, now we see how Daniel begins to interact with this pagan culture under a pagan king. Look at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who was appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus, the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So this is a famous passage, well-traveled. Um, but let's take our time and walk through what's going on uh, here in, 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 in this portion of, of chapter 1 of Daniel. So number one, before Daniel starts interacting, he purposes in his heart that he's not going to defile himself. It begins inside, internally, in the immaterial part of us, in our heart, our mind, our affections, our mind, our will, and our emotions. And he decides that he's not going to compromise. Daniel decides he's not going to defile himself. And you might be wondering, it's like, well, we're just talking about some food here. I mean, the king is giving him the best food, uh, the choice food. He's giving him uh, wine out of his personal wine cellar. And what is the, what is the problem? Well, uh, the problem is in the, the meat that's prepared, how it was prepared, and that it was sacrificed to pagan gods. Uh, take a look at Exodus 34 and 15. Exodus 34 and 15. Lest you make a, co a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, they, and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods, and one of them invites you and eats of his sacrifice. So Daniel, being um, an intelligent, studious young man, uh, he remembers reading in Exodus 34 and 15. So when he walks into the banquet hall and he sees this food that's been sacrificed to pagan gods and it's, it's not according to the, the Jewish dietary laws, before he 
even gets to that point, he purposes in his heart that, look, I'm not going to compromise on this. And then we see his interaction with the chief of the eunuchs and then the, the steward placed over them. And so Daniel um, is brought into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Now, there's no reason for him to be in the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Um, Daniel at this point is probably around 15 years old. He's essentially a slave um, that was brought in from a, another conquered land. Daniel doesn't have any power, doesn't have any position other than um, it would please the king of Babylon for him to be trained for service in the king's court. So there are times that it doesn't matter about your particular position or, or your standing, but God can just move on your behalf, regardless of you being qualified. God will move on your behalf with those that are in authority over you. And we can, we can thank God and praise God for, for that right there, just in terms of honoring that Daniel decided not to compromise. God is going to go ahead of him and touch the hearts, the minds, to give him favor and goodwill with someone that's in authority over him when there's no reason that this chief of eunuchs should have any reason to like Daniel. So he pretty much tells Daniel that, look, this is what's on the menu, eat what's on the menu. If you don't eat what's on the menu and you're not looking healthy, then it's, it's, it's not just my job, it's my head. Because right now we live in a democracy and we have the opportunity to have representative government and we can have um, elections, we can vote, we can have debate and discourse. Well, in this time period, there was no such thing. The king of Babylon was a dictator with absolute authority. So if the king was not pleased and he decided off with your head, off your head went. So the Chief of the eunuchs is considering his uh, long-term health prospects, and he wants to keep his head on his shoulders where it is. But obviously, Daniel is not trying to get him in trouble, but he just knows that he's convicted that he cannot defile himself. And so what he does is go to the steward that the chief of the eunuchs set over him, so essentially the assistant. And says, look, 10 days. Test us for 10 days. Give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine us. And if we're not in better shape than everybody else in our age group, then do with us whatever you want to do with us. But give us the opportunity so that we will not have to defile ourselves. Put us on this particular diet. And then we'll see after 10 days. So this assistant, this steward says, okay, no problem. 10 days. 10 days can't be, can't do too much damage in 10 days. Um, so we'll see. But after that, if you're not, if you're not in as good a shape at least as everybody else in 10 days, then we can't keep doing this. And so they ask for two things. They ask for vegetables to eat and water to drink. And the word there that is, that is rendered vegetables, it really just means sown things. It means sown things. So they don't want any meat. They just want things that would come out of the ground. They want things that would not be in violation of the law. Okay. And if you look at your next blank under verses 8 through 16, Daniel asked for vegetables and water because they would not violate the law 
with the meat and with the wine, they had to worry about how it was paired and who it was sacrificed to. But the vegetables and the water would not be subject to that. So they could eat vegetables or grains. They could eat that and have good conscience. Okay, Mosaic law, your next blank, Mosaic law does not name any vegetables or sown things as unclean. That's your next blank, unclean. So this was a way, they weren't just trying to go on a particular diet. What they were trying to do is how can we sustain ourselves but also at the same time not violate our conscience and not violate the laws uh, of the Jewish diet, okay? And so, of course, it was not just the diet, but it was, um, it was God that uh, brought favor and goodwill, just like he did with people. There, there may have been in this time period some supernatural sustenance that, that helped Daniel and his friends. And it looks, look at verse 14. It says, so he consented, and he being the steward that was placed over them by the chief of the eunuchs, he consented with them in this matter, tested them 10 days, and at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And watch this. Thus the steward took away their portion of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So it gives us the picture and the idea that when it was time to eat, they were bringing everything out in front of them, but then they were choosing not to eat of the meat and they were not drinking the wine. But once they passed the test, then the steward was no longer bringing the delicacies and the wine out. Does that make sense? So when you're going through a, a testing and a, and a trial, okay, you're going through a difficult time in your life, it seems like when you're trying to change a habit in your life or there's, there's some area of sin that you're trying to sanctify that portion of your life and get that away, it seems like that is the time when the most temptation comes around. When you're trying to get your mind off of something, that's when you can't get away from it. And so every day, those 10 days, they're bringing this delicious meat and this wine in front of them every day, every day. And they're looking at everybody else enjoying the meat, enjoying the wine, and they have a plate that's right there. It's available for them. But they are not wanting to violate their conscience, and they're eating their vegetables, drinking their water. Eating their vegetables, drinking their water. But eventually, at the end of the time of testing, the steward takes away the portion of the delic delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and just gave them vegetables. So then at some point, at the end of the time of testing, you will see that temptation, if not all together, but to, to a greater degree removed because you have passed that time of testing. So we're almost, almost done. We look at verses 17 through 20. In Daniel chapter 1, as we come to the conclusion, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them, all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were all in his realm. So we see that God um, 
Bless all these young men, said he gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. But it says specifically of Daniel that he had a gift. He had uh, an understanding in all visions and dreams. So if you're looking at your handout, God gave Daniel and his friends knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. All literature and wisdom. So uh, Daniel and his friends, they, they read widely. They were schooled in multiple disciplines. So they knew about art, science, mathematics. They studied all these things and they had the ability to understand them and they had the ability to demonstrate that they were proficient in all these different areas. But then Daniel was, is, is, is given over and above that a special gift. Daniel was given the gift of interpretation is your next blank. Daniel was given the gift of interpretation for visions and dreams. So all of us have particular natural gifts. We're naturally gifted. We were, we were born and in our flesh, we, were, we are just naturally good at certain things. And that's what is, is being discussed here is that these young men had a natural aptitude that was then developed by their education. But then over and above your natural uh, talents are gifts that are bestowed. And so in the New Testament, we learn that every believer has at least one spiritual gift. And that gift goes beyond just what you're naturally good at. But it's a gift that's given to you for the edification of the body. Now, it can enhance, that gift can enhance something that you're already good at. But it gives you... Um, uh, a, a, it gives you a special, um, a special gift in order to do something in particular, and that can be uh, something that's used for the edification of the body of Christ. And in this case, for Daniel, he's given the gift of interpretation of visions and dreams, and we'll see where that comes into play later in Daniel. And so. To take a look, see, look, look at look at Proverbs one and seven. Proverbs one and seven, just to have a a timeless uh, truth applied to this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, because they honored God. They had a particular understanding because they understood the world because they looked at it the way God looked at it. And because of that, uh, it just enhanced their ability to understand all these new things and take into account that they're learning a new language at the same time. They spoke Hebrew, and now they are uh, in Babylon um, studying the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So if you think that your assignments are difficult in, in elementary, in junior high, high school, even on the collegiate level, master's program, imagine having to learn what you're learning, taking a full load of four or five classes per semester and doing it in a different language. So this just goes to, this is a testament to um, how intelligent these young men were. And so not only were they seen as so bright amongst their peers, but look at, at what happened when the king interviewed them. In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, so he tests them in all these different uh, disciplines. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. So 
the king of Babylon, and when you see the word magicians and astrologers, we're, we're not talking about somebody that's pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Um, we're talking, that, that, that term would refer more to someone that was a scribe, more like a modern day professor. So he gets the PhDs um, all around, to, to, and he's personally doing this examination, Nebuchadnezzar is. He's personally doing this examination, and he finds these four boys ten times better than who he thought were the smartest guys in the room. So again, supernatural gifting, supernatural enablement, and Daniel and his friends were rated that highly against the PhDs, not just their class. It's one thing to be best in class. It's another thing to be the best period and 10 times as good as the, as the, as the next guy. And so we're introduced to Daniel, we're introduced to his friends, and then verse 21 just gives us um, one quick detail that, that most people would just gloss over. Um, verse 21 said, thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. So we're introduced to Daniel and his friends. And remember Daniel, when you look at the top of your handout, they were brought into Babylon at 605. At 605. Since, they've, since Daniel has uh, recorded for us, that he continued on till the first year of King Cyrus, we can know historically that King Cyrus, his first year was around 539 BC. Okay, so that's your next that's your next blank. The first year of King Cyrus was 539 BC. So a little bit of quick math, that would make Daniel's government career span 66 years. 66 years. So that that short one verse spans a lifetime. His entire career um, because Daniel was um, alive and operating the entire uh, 70 year exile that they are in in Babylon. And another thing that's important is not just that Daniel at probably the age of about 15 right now would have a 66 year career and put him into his mid 80s by the end of the book. That in and of itself is a tremendous blessing. And I'm encouraged reading it and, and, and looking at it because of a few things that that means is that number one, it doesn't matter at what age you are, God can use you in that age and throughout all your years. God can use you in your age right now and throughout all of your years. Daniel lived longer than the additional 66 years, but the Bible's talking about when it says he continued, that's talking about his particular career. So Daniel worked, Daniel served, and this is your last blank, Daniel served under four different government administrations. Four different government administrations. And so it's, it's, it's difficult to think about someone of such a great reputation that was a high level official that has served in the last four presidential administrations. Personally, I'm not aware of a single individual that has a sterling reputation that is liked by um, people of all parties, all stripes, um, that has served in what would be, in terms of the United States, 
the Trump administration, the Obama administration, the Bush administration, and the Clinton administration all at the same time. Or not all at the same time, but, but uh, con that, that this would happen in, in succession of four different administrations. Does that make sense? So Daniel was respected um, by those in Babylon and obviously that's why he had such a long uh, career and no one could attack Daniel's character. So we see that Daniel as a young man started off with a view that there would be no compromise in terms of his conscience. So he defined his character by what was prescribed in the scriptures. He didn't attempt to try to um, say, well, you know, how I was raised, that was in Jerusalem. So at Jerusalem High, that's how they did things. But now I'm at Babylon University, and this is how they do things. So when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. Daniel would not accept such a proposition. Then he went on from defining his character based on what God has said in his scriptures to also developing that character through what we've seen as far as what he endured being deported, what he endured having to be uh, ripped away from his family, what he endured from having to be taken to a foreign land and having to learn a new language and study to serve a king that he knew was pagan and that would live um, in at least, at least in part, contrary to what God has declared. But then he would also display that character over a lifetime of service, a lifetime of righteousness. He would display that, that his friends would see, and that also that his overseers would see, that the pagan king would see, and that the culture at large would see. So take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despised, despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So God says in his word, those who honor me, I will honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. And I think that we can take some cues from Daniel in terms of how we ought to live now in defining, developing, and displaying our Christian character and that it begins and ends with us honoring God. And when we honor God, God will honor us. God will honor us. Well, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to uh, go through this first chapter of Daniel and uh, going through some timeless truths about uh, how we ought to define and develop and display character uh, in our time as Christians. I pray that the Lord would bless and keep you, and I encourage you to continue reading uh, in the book of Daniel and study and, and let the Holy Spirit uh, illuminate uh, this scripture for you. Uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to spend. Some of us are gathered together physically others of us are uh, connecting virtually father god but wherever we are 
We ask that you would uh, put in us, God, a desire and a discipline to study your word, Father God, and help us as we seek to honor you, Father God. We know that when we honor you, uh, Father, that you will honor us. Keep us in our going out and in our coming in. We ask these and all other blessings in the precious and powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.